The English city of Bristol is a pleasant place, home to plenty of shops, old architecture, and a thriving green economy scene. It's one of the nicer places to live in England. However, if we turn back the clock a few hundred years, Bristol experienced one of the freakiest events in its history. Today, come along with us as we figure out exactly what happened. And of course, if you're interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. So, first things first, what happened? While the historical record isn't 100% clear, it appears that between January 20th and January 31st of 1607, the usually calm city of Bristol experienced a major weather event. The story goes that the Bristol Channel, which lies between Southeast Wales and England, was hit with a massive wall of water. This wall surged up the channel, overcame the seawalls and basic flood defenses, and smashed its way through coastal towns and villages. Once it got past the villages, it quickly surged inland at a speed faster than a horse could run. The wave was so strong that it even managed to hit the town of Glastonbury, despite it being 23 kilometers from shore. These surging waters spread quickly, and while Wales, Devon, and Somerset were all hit, it was Bristol that took the brunt of the damage. In certain parts of Bristol, the resulting floodwaters were a massive 7 meters high, and in neighboring Cardiff, the waters were so powerful, the foundations of the famed St. Mary's Church were completely destroyed. Destroyed buildings aside, the Bristol Channel storm was also quite deadly. While the death toll is hard to estimate with true accuracy due to the lack of a census, it has been estimated that somewhere between 500 and 2,000 people drowned in the floodwaters, that thousands upon thousands of sheep, lambs, and cattle that local farmers relied on passed away, and that an estimated 51,800 hectares of farmland was rendered unusable. This, in turn, negatively affected the harvest, likely killing or at least harming many more due to the resulting food shortages. As you might expect, a random, deadly flood in an otherwise stable area led to a lot of questions. At the time, the culprit was obvious, the Catholic Church. You see, during this time period, religion still played a very important role in the lives of the average person. It was also a very politically volatile time. After all, it was a little more than one year after the gunpowder plot, the recent rise of Puritanism, and the increasingly severe persecution of Catholics. Thus, it was politically expedient for English officials to scapegoat Catholics, claiming that the flood was God's punishment to England for not being Puritan enough. Of course, given the rise of modern understandings of geography and hydrology, it's pretty clear that it was not God, but natural forces that brought upon this flood. However, exactly what these forces were are still up to debate. As of now, there are two prevailing theories surrounding exactly what happened on that fateful January day. The windstorm theory, and the tsunami theory. The windstorm theory is currently seen as the most plausible. In short, the idea here is that a wind-driven storm surge superimposed itself onto an extreme spring tide, leading to waves being produced that were far greater than the norm. Now, in terms of the spring tides, scientists have actually been able to calculate the tides expected for January of 1607, based on the known periodical changes of astronomical forces. Their results showed that at that time in particular, the sun and moon both overlapped at the equator, resulting in stronger than normal tides that would have made an event like this possible. While it is harder to create models for wind patterns, the historical record also seems to indicate that some sort of windstorm occurred. First and foremost, it seems like the windstorm was something that predated the occurrence of the Bristol storm. In William Camden's 1607 edition of Britannia, he notes that a storm had been continuing for some time, stating that, quote, after a spring tide being driven back by a southwest wind, which continued for three days without intermission, and then again repulsed by a very forcible sea wind, it raged with such a tide." End quote. This is in addition to the fact that nearby Barnstaple Parish recorded the windstorm as having begun in the middle of the night, stating that, quote, This storm began at 3 o'clock in the morning and continued till 12 o'clock of the same day. End quote. This is significant because it is not weather, but impacts such as earthquakes or landslides that trigger tsunamis. Therefore, having a large windstorm before one would be a very odd coincidence. In fact, according to a special report by Moody's Risk Management Solutions Organization, the only account that does not mention any form of windstorm occurring before the main storm is not a scientific document, but the religious and propagandistic pamphlet, God's Warning to His People of England. In this text, it is recorded that the storm began at, quote, about nine of the clock in the morning, the sun being most fairly and brightly spread, end quote. 
While the lack of a mention of wind may sound sketchy, even this skewed text supports the notion that there was a storm rather than the occurrence of a tsunami. This is because, curiously enough, sunny conditions are typical of a certain type of extratropical cyclone that has been recorded in northwestern Europe in modern times. Therefore, the chance of the wave being a bona fide tsunami is low. What's even more curious is that those who didn't fall for Puritan propaganda also tended to believe in this. As put by poet John Stradling, quote, if you crave to understand the Severn's unwanted floods, what causes they have, and the source of this madness, the common people attribute it to the moon and the driving winds. They rise their mind no higher." End quote. And while one might argue that their lack of modern knowledge makes this point null and void, we'd say there is some value in what locals who were there at the time had to say about the situation. So what about the tsunami theory? Now, this theory first received serious attention in 2002 after Professor Simon Haslett of Bath Spa University and Australian geologist Ted Bryant of the University of Wollongong suggested that eyewitness accounts in the historical reports suggested that a tsunami, and not a windstorm, may have occurred. This theory borrows heavily from the aforementioned religious and propagandistic pamphlet, God's Warning to His People of England and it gained a lot of steam in the press after the 2004 tsunami in Thailand stoked fantasies of the idea of a similar English tsunami. It is also worth noting that in English plaques commemorating the event, there seems to be suggestions that the wave was in fact a tsunami. However, good science more or less disproves this otherwise interesting theory. You see, over the past 500 years, the largest earthquake to have occurred in the region was a magnitude 5.5 quake in the North Sea. Despite holding the title, it was still far too small to cause a tsunami. Typically, a tsunami can only form if an earthquake is at least a magnitude 7, and in order to make a tsunami as large as the Bristol event, the earthquake would have had to have been a magnitude 7.5. The main issue here is that if this were to have occurred, the resulting tsunami would not have remained localized to just Bristol. Rather, it is more than likely that it would have been experienced elsewhere. In fact, some research goes so far as to say that an earthquake as small as a magnitude 6 in this region would have been felt and reported across the whole of Ireland, Great Britain, and France. Therefore, it is almost certain that a tsunami did not occur despite the wild imaginations of some scientists and journalists. This leaves us with one lingering question. What is the risk of something this catastrophic occurring today? While there are a lot of factors that have changed since 1607, after all, the southwestern coast of England has slowly been eaten away by the loading of the continental shelf and rising sea levels, it appears that the risk of a similar storm is rather low. However, if it were to occur, it would be dangerous. The data suggests that there is a very real possibility that the waves could be about 1.5 meters higher than they were in 1607. And while it is true that coastal defenses have been beefed up since then, a storm surge would still deal some serious damage. In fact, in 2007, models were run to see how much the 7-meter high waves from the storm would affect the modern area of Bristol. The model found that even when you factor in coastal defenses, an estimated 9 billion pounds or just over 11.2 billion dollars worth of property damage would occur in a similar storm. Worse still, the existence of the Hinkley Point nuclear power stations directly on the coast is also a problem. This is because, if it gets hit by waves, there is a very real risk of widespread radiation contamination that could easily kill thousands. Remember Fukushima? We're talking about a somewhat similar situation here. As such, while we may be more prepared for a storm now than we were in 1607, chances are that a similar event would still have a rather bleak outcome. So now we spring it back to you guys. What do you think caused the Bristol storm of 1607? And given what has changed, do you think that a similar storm would be relatively calm or catastrophic? Let us know in the comments down below. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.